We have to talk about the Gilded Age, both the HBO show and the era. We have to. That just has to happen. So let's get into this. For our cold open this week, I want you to close your eyes and with your imagination, travel with me to an amazing costume ball. The date, Monday, March 26th, 1883. Our hostess, Alva Vanderbilt. Now, dying to make a splash and break into the upper echelon of Gilded Age New York society, Alva Vanderbilt held the most spectacular and extravagant costume ball anyone had ever seen. Invitations went out to 1,300 guests who would enjoy a sumptuous dinner and the music of not one, but two orchestras. Now, remember, this is taking place in their, their private home, and they had two orchestras. My goodness. Okay, anyway, the setting was the stuff of pure fantasy. Thousands of orchids and roses and all kinds of -of out-of-season flowers were there. They cost somewhere in the neighborhood of $11,000. That would be about $300,000 in 2022. Well, those flowers filled the glittering rooms at the Vanderbilt's new chateau. Details of the party had been leaked to the press, so everyone in town seemed to know about it. A crowd, held in check by police, began to form early in the evening. It wasn't until 8.30 that the crowd actually had something to watch. Footmen in powdered wigs and 18th century style knee breeches and silk stockings rolled out a maroon carpet with gold edging all the way from the front door, and apparently there was an awning over the front door. So this carpet stretched from that awning to the street. It wasn't until 10 o'clock that evening that the magic actually started to happen. That's when a long line of carriages began to pull up with the Vanderbilt's guests. And wow, they were each wearing the most sumptuous costumes depicting historical figures, characters from books and operas, queens and fairies, kings and queens, Greek gods and goddesses, toreadors, gypsies, Gosh, you name it, and there was a costume for it. All of the costumes were in satin and velvet and brocade and, of course, endless diamonds. As the guests entered, trumpeters positioned at the top of the grand staircase played a fanfare to announce their arrival as they made their way to the great dining room. Everywhere there were palm fronds, ferns, orchids, roses, bougainvillea, all laced with delicate electric lights. The party began with quadrilles. What's a quadrille, you ask? Well, I didn't know either, so I had to go out to YouTube to watch a few. And they look like square dances. Only, of course, they're not the super fast square dances with someone calling out dance steps. From what I can tell, a quadrille contains four couples that do these choreographed spins and twirls and steps together. Honestly, I think it looks like a lot of fun. Are there still quadrille dances today? I don't actually know, but if I was invited to one, I would totally go. Okay, anyway, later at two o'clock in the morning, An eight-course supper was served among the floral fantasy of their setting. Two artificial fountains provided a backdrop while guests dined, and at the center of the room was a huge palm tree that reached the ceiling. The guests danced literally until dawn. They began to depart at six o'clock in the morning. Wow, so this sounds like the ball of the century, right? It turns out it wasn't. There was an even more ostentatious ball a few years later in 1879. Thrown by Cornelia and Bradley Martin and known as the Bradley Martin Ball, that one was so over-the-top extravagant that it drew fire from newspapers and clergymen as being hedonistic and a sign of the elite's obliviousness to the needs of the poor. This, my friends, is the Gilded Age. And we're going to get into it in tonight's show. I adapted that description of the famous Vanderbilt Costume Ball of 1883 from a wonderful book 
A Season of Splendor by Greg King. That was just one of the books that I read in preparation for tonight's show. And I'm going to link all of those books in the show notes. Oh, there is a lot to cover tonight. So what do you say we get started? Hit it, maestro. Hi there, this is Jennifer Passarello from Circa19XX.com. Welcome to Circa Sunday Night. Why don't you put on your flapper dress and a long strand of pearls and let's Charleston our way to Dreamsville. Hey, this show is the cure for insomnia. This show is Circa Sunday Night. Greetings, everyone. I hope you've had a pleasant couple of weeks. Now, I have to start tonight's episode with an excuse. This episode is going out into the world late. Yeah, I know. If you're new here, uh, you may not realize that I make a lot of excuses, but... (laughs) If you're not new here, this is just the latest in a long line of excuses, but I really do have a good one this time. I've been sick, so I I literally had no voice to record with. In fact, I think my voice still sounds kind of strange to me, and uh, I've still got a little bit of a scratchy throat and that kind of thing. So, oh, there you are. But I'm feeling better now, and it is good to be back behind the microphone. We are together at last. Hey, if you are new, welcome. I'm Jennifer Passarello, and I'm your cruise director as we journey to parts both known and unknown on the timeline of the early 20th century. Hey, how do you like that? I just kind of made that up (laughs) on the spot as I was going along. Uh, I don't know. I I may use that one. Again, I have always wanted to be a cruise director, you know, just like Julie on the love boat. Does anyone remember Julie on the love boat? That was a thing at one time. And uh, gosh, what is it about ship references and Circa Sunday Night? Lately, we've spent some time on on some ships, haven't we? So we were on the Queen Mary for our Halloween episode. And then our very last episode, we sailed aboard the ill-fated Princess and Victoria Louise. You know what? I have another ship show in my head that I don't know, might make it into this season, kind of turn it over in my mind. We shall see. I don't know. Anyway, we sail the seven seas on this show. much for stopping by tonight. If you would do me a great favor and subscribe to my YouTube channel, I would be so thrilled. My channel's brand new, only a couple weeks old, and I do admit there's almost nothing out there. But I'm hoping to grow it and eventually put out a variety of content there. Let's see what's happening out on the YouTube channel. Well, I have one subscriber. Oh, thank you, subscriber. Um, I think it might be my mom, but uh, I, I don't know. I don't know how to see who the subscribers are. Anyway, if you would go out there and subscribe, I would be so honored. I'll put a link to the channel in the show notes. Now, if YouTube is not your thing, don't worry. You can still listen to Circus Sunday Night in all the usual podcast directories. 
So if you would give this show a five-star review on your preferred platform, that would help me out so much. I would really appreciate it. <sighs> okay, there. I got the bit about the subscriptions and the ratings done. I always hate that part. <laughs> I've been watching The Gilded Age on HBO. That's a new show brought to us by Julian Fellows. Now, you remember him. He's the one that created Downton Abbey. Incidentally, he's written some books that I've enjoyed a lot, too. So I was a huge Downton Abbey fan, and then when that went off the air, I just had to find something to fill that vacuum, and I found some books that Julian Fellows had written, and I actually enjoyed them. They're, they're kind of fun reads. So I think the one I liked the most was Belgravia. That was set in an era that's a little early for me usually. That's the early 1800s. As you know, I gravitate toward the early 1900s, but it was still a fun read. He also wrote a book called Snobs and another book called Past Imperfect. Now, all of these books, while they're set in different eras, involve the wealthy class. So for those of us not in that class, <laughs> which would include me. It's kind of fun to peer into that world, isn't it? Okay, but back to Downton Abbey. The next film in that series is coming out in April. That's only a few weeks away. Will we be talking about that on Circa Sunday night? Uh, yes, we will. <laughs> now, that film is called Downton Abbey, A New Era, and I can't wait for that one. Okay, so I have a lot to say about the Gilded Age show, and I also want us to explore the Gilded Age era a little bit. But before we do all of that, I want to ask you a favor. Will you indulge me for a few minutes and let me talk about a personal matter? Now, this personal matter has zero to do with the Gilded Age, but it's on my mind, and I just kind of feel like I need to talk about it. Now, this could be potentially very boring, so if you want to skip ahead and just bypass this next section, I totally understand. That's fine. But as I said, I've got this thing on my mind, and I really need to talk about it. I found out this week that an old dilapidated shopping mall the White Lakes Mall in Topeka, Kansas, where I spent just about every Saturday when I was in high school, is being torn down. I'm actually kind of surprised by my reaction to this bit of news. You know, it's stirred up some melancholia and old memories that I haven't thought about in years. White Lakes has been abandoned and in terrible shape for many years. In fact, the last pictures I saw of it, the roof was even caving in. So not only was it dilapidated, but apparently an arsonist had set fire to it a few months ago. And so it, it's been in really bad shape. And I myself have not even been in Topeka for a very long time. And so naturally I haven't been by the mall, nor have I really thought about the mall in decades. But I guess in the back of my mind, I always knew that it was still standing. It still existed. And soon it's not going to exist anymore except in my memories and already those memories are growing pretty dim. I grew up in Topeka and when I was in high school White Lakes Mall was the place that we all went every weekend. It was the place where as a 15 year old I applied for my first real jobs. Now I'd been a babysitter before but I never had a real job you know with a real boss and real paychecks and that kind of thing. And I remember getting all dressed up and going from store to store with my little resume in my hand, asking for job applications. And of course, back then that resume was pretty empty. There wasn't anything on it, but there I was going store to store, trying to get a job. Now I didn't end up getting my first job there. I ended up getting my first job down the street at a department store called Richmond Gordman's, which was the best job any teenager could ever hope to get. So it all worked out for the best. 
But you know what? Richmond Gorman's doesn't exist anymore either. Anyway, back to White Lakes. When I wasn't in school or working at Richmond Gorman's, I was at the White Lakes Mall with my friends. And I remember this wonderful little jewelry store there called The Hat Box. And that's where I got my ears pierced Ouch. twice Ouch. and where I bought my first pair of earrings. I spent hours and hours there at the mall playing Miss Pac-Man at Aladdin's Castle Arcade. I got my first credit card at the J.C. Penney's at White Lakes Mall right after I got my job at Richmond Gorman's because I'd heard that, you know, it was good to establish a credit history and a J.C. Penney's credit card would help me do that. White Lakes Mall was also the setting for the local Jerry Lewis telethons for years. Remember those? And then in my senior year of high school, my speech class participated in this program, and I, I think it was called something like Window on the Classroom. And it was something that the school district had cooked up, which involved setting up a classroom in the middle of the mall. So we were bused in to the mall each day for an hour, and then shoppers could stop and watch us being students <laughs> and learning in our classroom on their way to one of the stores like the Hallmark store or the Town Crier bookshop or let's see what were some of the other stores there was a Foxmore boutique you know one of those stores so anyway there we were in the mall having class and I remember it felt just as weird then as it sounds now Walgreens used to have a store there and they had an awesome restaurant you could sit in a booth and watch the shoppers go by. Yeah, I don't know if there are any Walgreens left that actually have restaurants in them, but when I was a kid, there was one. Now, one time when I was really small, my mom and I went there and we had grilled cheese sandwiches. Now, I only vaguely remember those sandwiches, but I remember my glass of water really well because it had a dead fly floating in it. And then when I was in high school, one of our favorite places to eat was the Orange Julius food stand. We'd get California dogs there that were essentially hot dogs smothered in chili and American cheese. So they were chili dogs, basically. But of course, we would also get an Orange Julius. And if you're not familiar with those, because I don't know if they're still around. I mean, I haven't had one in a million years, but they were those creamy orange juice drinks that I, I don't know. They, there was orange juice. There was milk. I don't know what all was in there. But anyway, they tasted awfully good. They were something between a milkshake and orange juice. Now, that Orange Julius stand is actually what has brought on kind of this melancholia that I'm feeling when I think about White Lakes coming down. The other day, I saw a YouTube video with this young guy and he was walking around. He's one of those urban explorers. Have you ever seen those videos on YouTube? Well, he was walking through the mall. And he had even said this was one of the last films, if not the last video, in the mall before they tear it down. And I think he filmed this back in December. But anyway, he's walking around. And I mean, the place looks like a disaster area. It, it's almost completely unrecognizable, just really ruins of what once was White Lakes Mall. But there's one feature that is still recognizable, and it's the canopy that was over the, um, the counter where you would order at Orange Julius. So that's the only recognizable thing in that mall, and it's still standing in the middle of all this rubble. I mean, it's just kind of surreal. So the guy in the video didn't know what that canopy was. The sign is long gone. And, I, you know, so how could he know what that was? But I knew. That's where my friends and I would eat those California dogs and try to get the attention of the cute boys from school who were also hanging out there. Oh gosh, you know, time marches on. And I guess this is how you know you're getting old. When you start telling stories that no one could possibly find interesting but you about places that only you care about. <laughs> but uh, anyway, 
If you are at all curious about White Lake Mall, I'm going to try to find that YouTube video and put a link to it in the show notes so you can see at least that orange Julius canopy that kind of threw me into this little, I don't know, this little sad uh, mood that I've been in ever since I saw that. Okay, well, now I've lost about two-thirds of my audience. <laughs> so how about if we dive into the Gilded Age? Well, when I learned about this show, I knew I had to check it out. New episodes air every Monday night. And as I'm recording this, tomorrow night will be episode four. So if you haven't watched this yet and you think you might want to, it's not too late. It should be easy to catch up. A couple of things to note about this show. In many ways, it feels like Downton Abbey. It's not exactly like Downton Abbey, but there are components of the show that do feel a little bit like Downton Abbey. We've got the downstairs characters and the society characters. There's drama both upstairs and downstairs. And then, of course, we have spectacular sets, and they are spectacular. They're not quite as authentic as what we found in Downton Abbey because they are sets. I'll talk more about that later on, but they are beautiful. And then, of course, we have the gorgeous gowns. Oh, sigh. The clothes are beautiful. Oh, and there is a spectacular ballroom. Now, we've only gotten a glimpse of, of the ballroom so far, but even that glimpse, oh, yeah, it's just dreamy. Now, if you've been around for a while, you know how much I love a good ballroom. One other thing to note, though, is that this is HBO, not PBS. For those of you listening from outside of the United States, PBS is our public broadcasting system, and that's where Downton Abbey originally aired for us. Downton first aired in the UK, and then it would come to the US a few months later. And when it did come to the US, it would air on PBS. Now, I don't know, actually, if The Gilded Age is airing in the UK. I kind of think it's not, but I could be wrong about that. Let me know if you're on YouTube. Let me know in the comments if you're in the UK and you've seen The Gilded Age. But anyway, HBO is a premium uh, streaming service with a gigantic budget. I don't like HBO. And the reason why I don't like HBO is because it's too edgy for me. They have no qualms about explicit sexual situations, adult content, violence, that kind of thing, and I don't like that. You know, in my old age, I really try to protect my brain from that kind of stuff. I mean, people are so careful about the healthy foods that they put into their bodies, but they don't think twice about putting these toxic images and subject matter into their heads. And honestly, I didn't either. <laughs> you know, when I was younger, I didn't, I didn't care about that kind of stuff. But I do now. And the only reason why I have HBO at all is because it comes free with my internet service. If I had to pay extra for it, I wouldn't subscribe. And I've never watched anything on it other than The Gilded Age. But anyway, as a result, The Gilded Age feels a little darker than Downton. And, um, you know, I'll be honest with you, if it goes too far, I'm going to stop watching. But the characters are kind of fascinating. And as I mentioned, the visuals are stunning. So HBO, don't let me down. What I thought we would do tonight is get familiar first with the Gilded Age era and then dive into the show. So you know the drill. Let's go ahead and load up the time machine. Okay, and we're going to dial up the year 1882 just because that's when the show begins. And off we go. Let us hide behind a pair of fancy glasses 
and make faces when a member of the classes passes. Let's go smelling where they're dwelling. Yeah, dear. Yeah. Slipping everything the way they do. Let us go to it, they do it. Why can't we do it too? Let's go slumming, no slumming at Park Avenue. Come on, Ray, what do you say? We'll take it slumming. Okay. I say, do let's go slumming, shall we? I think it'd be an awfully good idea. Go up Park Lane, all that sort of thing. Park Avenue, you call it, of course. Let us hide behind a pair of fancy glasses. Glasses? And make faces when a member of the classes. What? Passes. That's better. Let's go smelling where they're dwelling. Oh, definitely. We will do the sniffing just like they always do. do, 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 do. Let us go to it. They do it. Why can't we do it, too? Rather. We'll put on our evening clothes and take some of this and those at Park Avenue. Well, what's this? We seem to be at a dinner party. And let's be honest, we are completely underdressed. <laughs> it's a good thing these guests can't see us, but we can't miss them. They sparkle like stars in the sky. The people are acting a little strangely, I have to say, at least by today's standards. I'm not really sure what's going on here, but it seems like we're watching a very choreographed ritual. Now, I'm going to consult a fabulous book on the Gilded Age. Hold on one second. Let me grab it. And this is one of the books that I read in anticipation of tonight's episode. And I'm hoping that this can give us a little bit of insight into what we're watching here at this dinner party. The book that I'm looking at is called A Season of Splendor by Greg King, and it is fabulous. I could not put this book down. All right, so maybe he can straighten us out. Let me find the section here on dinner parties. Okay, I've got it. Here's how he describes the dinner party of the Gilded Age. Dinner guests usually arrive 30 minutes before a meal. Livery grooms waited at the curb, opening carriage or motor car doors and assisting guests out of their vehicles and up the steps, where another groom bowed as they entered. Here, footmen attired in frilled shirts, brocaded coats, knee breeches, silk stockings, and patent leather shoes directed them to the cloakrooms. Ladies deposited their furs, wraps, and muffs, while gentlemen handed over their coats, hats, scarves, and white gloves. These guests were always uniformly attired, ladies in formal evening gowns, long gloves, and an abundance of jewelry, and gentlemen in white tie and tails. In the cloakroom, gentlemen were motioned to a table where there was a silver tray that held a selection of boutonnieres provided by the hostess. A second tray held small white envelopes, each inscribed with a gentleman's name, and then within each envelope, there would be a gilt-edged card with the name of the lady that he was to escort into the dinner. The gentleman had no say in such alliances, which were all arranged in advance by the hostess in accordance with her seating plan. The hostess waited to greet each guest personally before they passed into the drawing room, and the butler loudly announced each name at their approach. Here, a welcoming fire might burn, adding to the luster of the shimmering crystal chandeliers and sconces that caught the sparkling diamonds of the ladies and sent prisms of light dancing across the gilded chairs. Enormous arrangements of roses, orchids, and lilacs sprouted from priceless Chinese vases, adding their scent to the hickory logs on the hearth and, occasionally, a whiff of incense that lingered from a censer swung through the rooms a few moments before the guests arrived. In some houses, a footman might offer guests an aperitif from a silver tray. After 15 or 20 minutes, the butler appeared and announced, Madame, dinner is served. The hostess rose, and then she offered her arm to the most important male guest. The gentlemen sought out the ladies named on their cards and led them in procession to the dining room. According to etiquette, the hostess always entered the dining room last. Now, within the dining room, one large long table was preferred for dinners with fewer than 50 guests. There were more than 50 guests. There could be a number of smaller round tables. 
Now, it looks like this particular dinner party that we've landed on is about 50 people, so we've got one long table. The table was draped with felt, most often red felt, but occasionally green, and that was topped with a white damask cloth from Ireland or France. Now, this cloth was often exquisitely embroidered with floral garlands, cartouches sewn with the owner's monogram, and open scrolls through which you could peek that red felt. The top of the white cloth might be further embellished with a runner of crimson velvet, sewn with foliate designs in gold thread or silver thread and adorned with colorful peacock feathers. Napkins generally match the white damask of the tablecloth, but at the turn of the century, napkins embroidered with monograms and fringed with gold lace became fashionable. Roses, violet, carnations, orchids, and lilacs were used for decoration. One might find a central silver basket of roses rising three or four feet in the center of the table, and the base worked with carefully arranged tendrils of ivy that spread the length of the table. Or there could be a vase of tall lilies and palm fronds at intervals down the length of the table, mixed in with smaller arrangements of lavishly cascading roses, orchids, lilies, and ivy. Occasionally, a hostess might offer an additional unexpected arrangement, such as a canopy of roses and lilies woven with ivy, palm fronds, ferns, and boughs of evergreen suspended from the ceiling. And woven within that would be those tiny electric shimmering lights. This was intended to produce a dreamy kind of atmosphere. Every object on the table was carefully placed for maximum effect. Tall gilded candelabra stood at intervals, the flames of their wax candles shielded by either white or light pink silk shades. They alternated with silver bowls of pineapple or sugared fruits. Laying the table normally took several hours. The butler worked with white-gloved footmen, carefully measuring each piece placed with a small rod to ensure uniformity. A usual place setting, or cover, as it was known, included ten pieces of silver. On the right was an oyster fork placed atop the soup spoon. There was a bread knife, a fish knife, a meat knife, and a salad knife. To the left was a fish fork with curved tines to flake the fish, a meat fork, a salad fork with widely spaced tines to avoid bruising the lettuce, and a fruit fork. When each course was completed, the footman would remove the used silver with the plate. Additional pieces of silver not already laid would accompany their respective courses, placed on either side of the new plate. Often these services were works of art in their own right, composed either of silver or ormolu, their ornately scrolled handles decorated with family crests and the initials of the owners. At the center of each plate was a damask napkin folded three times to form a small pyramid holding a dinner roll. A second napkin would be brought with the dessert course. Directly above the plate was a hand-lettered place card with the guest's name, flanked by individual silver salt cellars and pepper cellars, and also a small silver dish of salted nuts. There was also a handwritten menu. Often these were written in French on gilt-edge vellum cards. It was customary to provide some small favor for each attendee, set out at his place setting at the table. These were generally painted ribbons, fans, card cases, tie pins, or little jeweled eggs, although by the turn of the century, it was common for hostesses to lavish engraved silver cigarette cases, gold cufflinks, and jewelry upon their guests. If crystal finger bowls were used, they were placed atop lace doilies with violet and rose petals floated on the surface. Dinners rarely encompassed fewer than eight courses, and sometimes they extended to 12 or 14 courses, although it was understood that guests were in no way expected to partake everything offered. Now, conversation was lively, but following the standards of the day, that conversation focused on superficial matters, things like houses, travel, horses, music, and especially 
gossip. Coffee, sparkling water, and liquors signaled the end of the meal. At the conclusion, the hostess generally rose, and then she would retire into the drawing room with her female guests to engage in a half hour of conversation over coffee and tea. The gentlemen either remained at the table to smoke, drink port or brandy, and discuss business, or they retired to the library to do so. Occasionally, some entertainment might follow, a piano recital, a choral group to entertain, or, for the more adventurous, perhaps a group of gypsy dancers or fortune tellers. The goal was to provide suitable diversion from the need for continued conversation. Within an hour after the meal had ended, guests generally began to look for signals that would allow their leave without any insult to the hostess. Once a general lull had settled over the gathering, a keen hostess would rise from her chair with a fixed smile that no one could mistake as an invitation to linger and thank her guests for the pleasure of their company. The evening would then come to an end. Oh, goodness, you know, what a different world this is from the one we know. So who were these people? Who would go to this kind of dinner party? Well, these were the society people in New York during the Gilded Age, which was an era of unprecedented and largely untaxed wealth. This was the era of the Astors and the Vanderbilts. Let's see, who else? The Rockefellers, the Carnegies, the Morgans. It was also the era and the social circle of Edith Wharton, you know, the American author. She wrote about this era in her books. Where did all the money come from? Well, some of it was inherited. So the old money, that came from inherited wealth. But the new money came from industry. So it came from steel, railroads, oil. Investments in banking was also a source of wealth. So the Gilded Age spanned from the 1870s to the beginning of World War I. And the research that I did in preparation for this episode, I saw an ending of the era anywhere between 1910 and 1914. So that overlapped the Victorian and Edwardian eras in the UK and the Belle Epoque in France and other European countries. Where did the name Gilded Age come from? Well, surprisingly enough, from Shakespeare, by way of Mark Twain. So listen to this. This is from Shakespeare's play, The Life and Death of King John. To be possessed with double pomp, to guard a title that was rich before, to gild refined gold, to paint the lily, to throw a perfume on the violet, to smooth the ice, or add another hue unto the rainbow, or with taper light to seek the beauteous eye of heaven to garnish, is wasteful and ridiculous excess. Have you ever heard the phrase gilding the lily? Well, that saying speaks to redundant beautification and excess. The lily is already beautiful. It doesn't need gilding, right? But it turns out the Shakespearean source doesn't say gilding the lily. It says, paint the lily and gild refined gold. But you know what? It all gets to the same point. Well, that little passage is a source from which Mark Twain and his one-time collaborator, Charles Dudley Warner, drew the title for their 1873 novel, The Gilded Age, A Tale of Today. Several decades after its publication, the era in which the novel was written from the 1870s to, again, the early 1900s, came to be called the Gilded Age. Now, this was a time, as I mentioned, of unbelievable wealth, but only of a very tiny group of people. So Twain and Warner's book really satirized this period as an era of serious problems beneath a very thin veneer of gold. Among the very wealthy, there was tremendous waste and greed and preoccupation with social standing. Everything in their world looked beautiful on the surface. And, uh, oh my, yes, it was very beautiful indeed. But below the surface, well, that's the stuff someone like Julian Fellows might turn into a show. (laughs) And, of course, he did. Now, Gilded Age Society moved about in a few different settings. New York was something of a home base, which makes sense, right? Because that was the center of commerce. 
But where else did these folks go? Well, they would go to Europe. England, France, and Germany were particularly popular in this set. But here in this country, they went to the Berkshires, for sure, and then Newport, Rhode Island. Hey, and guess who's going to Newport this summer? This girl. That's right. You know what? I had actually booked a trip to Newport last year, but I ended up canceling that trip and I went to Florida instead. But I have rebooked my trip and I'm all ready to head to the Breakers and Rosecliff and any other Gilded Age mansion that I can manage to tour. I can't wait. So I'm not going to be talking about Newport in tonight's show, even though it is a big feature in the Gilded Age. But I'm not going to talk about it tonight because I have a feeling I'm going to be doing a lot of talking about that in a future episode. But now let's talk about the people who are associated with the Gilded Age. Now, I listed some of the families earlier, the Carnegies, the Morgans, etc. But there are many others as well. There are two people in particular, though, that I want to focus on tonight. Caroline Astor and Alva Vanderbilt. Oh, wait, before we meet these two ladies, let's take a little detour for a brief lesson in Ormolu. In my research on the Gilded Age, this is a term that kept coming up. And this isn't exactly a new term for me. I knew Ormolu as a type of gold metal decoration that you see sometimes on old furniture, on vases, porcelain decorative objects, um, what else? Light fixtures, I've seen them on clocks and candelabra, sometimes even walls, like you go into a really grand library or something and there may be some paneling and you may see some ormolu on there. Now these are gold ornamental pieces that can be pretty intricate. They feature floral swags, flourishes, Sometimes you see cherubs or, um, oh, like architectural motifs, you know, like columns or that kind of thing. Ormolu pieces are beautiful. And I do run into them from time to time in antique stores. But what I always assumed was just gold colored metal is really real gold. At least real Ormolu is real gold. Now, Ormolu itself is actually gilt bronze. So bronze is the base metal, and then it has a thin skin of gold applied to it. The gold is typically 18 or 24 karat. Now, the word Ormolu refers to both the technique for gilding the bronze as well as the end product, which is gilt bronze. Bronze is a less expensive metal than gold, but of course, our friends in the Gilded Age loved the look of gold. So Ormolu was a reasonable alternative. Now don't think though that Ormolu was inexpensive. No chance. It was made by skilled craftsmen through a slow, painstaking, and honestly kind of dangerous process. And of course, we are talking about gold. Now the gilding process, let's talk about this for a minute because as I said, it was kind of dangerous. Now I'm taking this description of the process from MayfairGallery.com and it's got some pictures of Ormolu and then also some really amazing background. So I will include a link to uh, this webpage in the show notes. But here's what they had to say. The most common method for gilding bronze in the 18th and 19th century was what's known as mercury gilding or fire gilding. It's actually an ancient technique dating as far back as the third century BC. It involved applying a solution of mercuric nitrate to the bronze, followed by a mixture of mercury and ground gold powder known as an amalgam. The bronze was heated so that the mercury, which had a lower boiling point, evaporated leaving behind the gold powder, which was fused onto the surface of the bronze. Now, this method was dangerous because of the harmful mercury fumes produced by the process. Gilders often didn't survive past the age of 40. France, the center of most Ormolu production in the 19th century, actually outlawed the use of mercury in 1830 because of the danger involved. And yet, 
the law was so badly enforced that mercury gilding remained the main method of creating ormolu well into the 20th century and the Gilded Age. Nowadays, the process of gilding bronze involves a complicated electrochemical procedure known as electroplating or gold plating. This was a method which was developed midway through the 19th century, but it wasn't used widely until the 20th century. Well, gosh, you know, most of the Gilded Age mansions in New York are no longer standing, but one of the most famous of the era isn't in New York at all, but in the Blue Ridge Mountains of North Carolina. Yes, that's right, the Biltmore, which remains the largest home in America. Now, I visited the Biltmore a couple of years ago, and yes, I remember seeing examples of Ormolu. Ormolu is emblematic of the age, and I have a feeling I'm going to see a lot more of it when I go to Newport. But anyway, now we know all about it. We're here to learn, aren't we? <laughs> and now let's meet Caroline Astor. Caroline Astor, the Mrs. Astor, was the wife of William Pouse Astor Jr. Her own family could trace their wealth back to the Dutch New York aristocracy at the time of the city's founding. And her husband was wealthy too, but you know what? She actually had a better pedigree than he did. And I don't know if she had more money than he did, but she had an awful lot. She represented old money. Now, this is important because early in the Gilded Age, that really mattered. Mrs. Astor wanted to establish a non-titled American aristocracy. Non-titled meaning that, you know, we don't have anything like dukes and duchesses or counts and countesses or princes and princesses. And I don't know, what are the other titles? There are a lot of titles in Europe that we just don't have in the United States. Well, so there were no titles, but the old money elites were really the closest thing that America ever had to royalty. There's a lot to Mrs. Astor's story. I've just read a couple of books all about her, and she is fascinating. I'm only going to scratch the surface here because we don't want this podcast to be a million hours long. But uh, here's the short story on her. She actually had five children, and I want to take a little sidebar here because one of her sons has a particularly interesting story. So her son, John Jacob, or Jack Astor IV, died on the Titanic. You might remember him when, uh, you know, I believe he was portrayed in the movie Titanic. So he was the wealthiest person on board. He was also the wealthiest person in the world at that time. And uh, let's see, how old was he? Checking my notes here. 47. He was 47 years old. And his wife was five months pregnant. Now, when the ship was sinking, he loaded her onto a lifeboat and he asked if he could escort her. But uh, he was told, no, he couldn't because the boats were reserved for women and children. But uh, anyway, he loaded her on the lifeboat. He assured her that the sea was calm and that she would be okay and that he would see her in the morning. Well, he was last seen alive smoking a cigarette with the writer Jacques Futrell. I don't know who that is, but apparently he wrote detective stories or something. I don't know. Anyway. Astor's body was recovered on April 22nd, and he was identified by the initials sewn on the label um, on his jacket. And I, uh, on what's that, his life jacket? I just have in my notes his jacket. So I don't know if that was like the suit jacket he was wearing or his life jacket. But anyway, uh, one way or the other, his initials were the thing that identified him. Now, I read somewhere, and then I could not find the article again, but I read somewhere that um, he probably died being crushed as like those big smokestacks and, and other things started collapsing on the ship. And I don't know how anyone would know that unless it was because, you know, the his body, when it was recovered, indicated that might have been the case. Although... His body was recovered several days later, so I would imagine that he did not look real fresh and, you know, not like himself <laughs> at all by that point. 
But anyway, so that's the story of um, one of Mrs. Astor's sons. Well, she was raising her family. So for the first decades of her marriage, that's what her focus was on, is being a mom and, and managing the household. She was not focused on the society or reigning over society or any of that kind of stuff. But now later on, as her children were grown, she acquired this kind of creepy sidekick, Ward McAllister. And I will say Ward McCall uh, McAllister was actually referenced on the Gilded Age show. He was mentioned. I don't know that I've seen him yet. He will, I'm sure, kind of pop up on that show, but I don't know that I remember seeing him on the episodes I've seen so far. But anyway, he was like a full-time social expert, I guess. I don't know, self-proclaimed. I, I think he kind of created that role for himself, but he latched on to Mrs. Astor. She kind of latched on to him, and he helped her ascend to the very top of society. This is from Wikipedia. In the decades following the Civil War, the population of New York City grew exponentially, and immigrants and wealthy new arrivals from the Midwest began challenging the dominance of old New York money. Aided by the social arbiter, Ward McAllister, Mrs. Astor attempted to codify proper behavior and etiquette, as well as determine who was acceptable for inclusion in her social circle and who was not. They were the champions of old money and tradition. McAllister once stated that among the vastly rich families of Gilded Age New York, there were only about 400 people who could be counted on as members of fashionable society. He did not, as is commonly written, arrive at this number based on the limitations of Mrs. Astor's New York City ballroom. Good to know! Because that's what I had always heard. I thought that's where the 400 came from, that she could only fit 400 people in her ballroom, and so that's how she limited that group. But apparently that was not the case. Okay, so her husband's lack of interest in the social world did not stop, but instead fueled her uh, burgeoning social activities, which increased in intensity as her children grew older. Now, that's a common theme that I read in preparation for this episode, that it was really the women that cared about the social circles, which kind of seems like, you know, what you would expect. The men really didn't care that much. This was all about the ladies. Now, Mrs. Astor was, uh, back to Wikipedia, by the way, Mrs. Astor was the foremost authority on the aristocracy of New York in the late 19th century. She held ornate and elaborate parties for herself and other members of the elite New York socialite crowd. None was permitted to attend these gatherings without an official calling card from her. Mrs. Astor's social groups were dominated by strong-willed, aristocratic females. These social gatherings were dependent on overtly conspicuous luxury and publicity. More so than the gatherings themselves, Importance was highly placed upon the group of the upper crust of New York's elite. Now, as I said, there's a lot more to Mrs. Astor's story, but what I find most fascinating about her is the degree of power and influence that she was able to establish somewhat later in her married life. I mean, she was not a young woman when she rose to this level of prominence. I saw an interview with Julian Fellows in which he talked about Mrs. Astor, and he said that, you know, she was unattractive. And that is true, by the way. I've seen pictures of her, not a beautiful woman. And he couldn't find any description of her as being witty or charming or even just a good conversationalist. All she had was money, but there were others who were staggeringly rich too. And yet, no one else held that level of unbelievable sway. What a mystery. What was it about her that people were just, you know, they wanted to be approved by this woman? I don't know. It's just crazy. Okay, well, so then let's talk about her rival, Alva Vanderbilt. Alva was the wife of William Kissam Vanderbilt, who made his money in railroads. The Vanderbilts represented new money. 
they made their money. They didn't inherit it. Well, I, I don't know. Maybe they did inherit some money, but they certainly did not rise to the level of wealth that they had through inheritance alone. They didn't have the pedigree that the Astors had. And so Alva's early attempts to break into New York society were really thwarted at every turn. She could not gain acceptance into that 400. She was driven, and by all accounts, she was kind of a hard woman. She was a manipulator. Now, the Vanderbilts were extraordinarily wealthy, even by Gilded Age standards. And I think I read somewhere... I don't know if this is true, but I, it seems like I remember reading somewhere that the Vanderbilts were actually wealthier than the than the Astors. Um, but it wasn't just about the money, right? It was about the pedigree. And the Astors had that, the Vanderbilts did not. Now, you might remember that when I opened the show tonight, I described that over-the-top costume ball that the Vanderbilts held. Well. Alva deliberately left Caroline Astor's daughter, Carrie, off the guest list for that ball. That was a really shrewd move on Alva's part because that forced Mrs. Astor to pay a visit to the Vanderbilts. Now, remember that the media knew all about that costume party or that costume ball, and it was a big deal. So it was getting a lot of press even before the party actually took place. It would not be cool to be let, you know, left off of that guest list. So Mrs. Astor decided to pay a visit to the Vanderbilts, and that was highly symbolic. So that really opened the door to Alva to, you know, high society. Alva reciprocated by inviting Carrie and Mrs. Astor to the ball. Now, part of the lore of this moment is when Mrs. Astor was, I guess, said, she, she was supposed to have said, we have no right to exclude those whom this great country has brought forward. The time has come for the Vanderbilts. Okay, so now let's talk about the show The Gilded Age on HBO. New York is a collection of villages. The old have been in charge since before the revolution until the new people invaded. Well, I'm new. I've only just arrived. You are my niece, and you belong to old New York. George Russell is a power in the land. Before long, he'll put money into his pocket with every train ticket you buy. I think we should know the Russell family. We do not move in the same circles. Mama, you are incorrigible. I take that as the highest praise. Well, how do you find your aunts? Seda is kind, but not clever. And Agnes is clever, but not kind. Mrs. Van Ryn and her sad sister were spying on me today. I don't know why you bother with them. I don't bother with them. I'm afraid New York can be quite challenging at first. We haven't found it so, have we, George? There is no challenge you are not equal to, my dear. We have invited Marion to live with us. She hasn't a penny. I cannot live with an Aunt Agnes's confines. You must meet the right people in the right way. Money isn't everything, Agnes. Uh, I don't understand why they have taken me in. I have a job and the fresh start that I need. I want to do something with my life. For a New Yorker, anything is possible. You are the future, Mrs. Russell. And if you are the future, then they must be the past. Well, things move faster nowadays. I hope you're not against Miss Scott. She'll disrupt things. Maybe we need a bit of disruption. Let the tournament begin. Why don't we just go outside and roll in the gutter? It will save time. Do you know Newport well, Miss Russell? The mistress is not a player in the great game. That woman is unsuitable as an acquaintance. I'll make them pay one day. How can anyone be so rich? Apparently, Julie and Fellows had been playing around with this idea for several years before it actually hit the air. Now, it was originally conceived as a prequel to Downton Abbey. If you recall, in uh, Downton, Cora Crawley was an American, and she was what came to be known as a dollar princess. A dollar princess was a wealthy American who would marry into British aristocracy to bring her fortune to a dwindling estate in exchange for a fancy aristocratic title. She would have been a young girl in the 1880s, 
and the Gilded Age show takes place in the 1880s. Now, wouldn't that have been a fascinating premise? That would have been so cool. But alas, the Gilded Age did not evolve in that direction. No, instead it features two principal families that have nothing to do with the Crawleys. The Van Rhines, these are two sisters, they're aging sisters. One's a widow and the other's a spinster. And they kind of represent the old money. And then there are the Russells. They just built a spectacular mansion across the street. And they represent new money. The Russells are inspired by the Vanderbilts, by the way. Now, I'm not sure if the Van Rhines are based on any real historical figure uh, figures, but I know Mrs. Astor is a character in the show. And already we can see that Mrs. Russell, again, think Mrs. Vanderbilt, is having a really hard time breaking into Mrs. Astor's circle. The main storylines involve these two families. There are also some true historical events that are referenced. So the ladies on the show are discussing at one point the new opera house that's being built. And this is very controversial. There's a new opera house that's being built by new money wealth or, you know, new money families because they were shut out of boxes at the existing opera house by the old money families. So they said, well, the heck with that. We're going to build our own opera house, which became the Metropolitan Opera House. And that's something that really happened. So it was referenced on the show. That was a real event. Now, one of the things that was so amazing about Downton Abbey, and I just have to keep making these comparisons, is the setting of High Clear Castle. So Downton Abbey, while it was not really called Downton Abbey, it was a real place. The set of the Gilded Age you know, those mansions and everything, those are sound stages built to look like those mansions. Most of those old mansions are gone now. But as beautiful as those sets are, I don't know, some of the magic just seems like it's lost when you come to find out that, well, these are just sets. They're not real houses. They're just sets built for the show. One of the other things that the Gilded Age has working against it is the vast scope of the society that is part of this whole genre. So in Downton, our primary concern was a single family, the Crowleys and their staff. But in the Gilded Age show, I mean, wow, we have the potential for at least 400 characters to weave in and out of the story, not to mention other characters that fall outside of that elite group. So that's a pretty broad scope. Will this show be able to effectively manage that? Um, I don't know. I mean, certainly they're not going to cover all 400 people. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how they're going to manage all the players involved here. Now, one thing that both Downton Abbey and The Gilded Age have in common is that both series examine a time of change. In Downton, the change involved the crumbling of those old estates, the shrinking of the house staff, just all of the change that was happening after World War I. In the Gilded Age, we not only have that coming clash of new and old money, but in a larger sense, there's all these societal shifts that are coming because of the Civil War. So remember, the Civil War just ended, um, you know, not that many years prior. Now, as I mentioned, I am pretty intrigued by this show, and I would love it if the Gilded Age could become my new Downton Abbey. I'm sort of approaching this tentatively for the reasons that I mentioned before, so we shall see if I continue to watch it or not. But I did want to see what the critics had to say. And, um, well, actually, I only read what one critic had to say. I read a review in the New York Times, and... um, Yeah, it was less than flattering, I have to say. Um, You know, this particular critic thought the dialogue was inconsistent, the character uh, character development was somewhat lacking, Uh, it it lacked some of the the magic of Downton Abbey, and, uh, you know, I do have to say, though, that the first couple of episodes I did like. I like enough to continue watching, at least for now, so... Um, you know, I'm going to keep with it. Now, HBO, (laughs) keep it clean or I'm out. All right, well, I'm going to leave the Gilded Age right there for now. 
I'll be turning back to it this summer, I'm sure, when I go exploring those magical Newport mansions. But uh, I guess uh, that will do it for tonight's show. Can it really be time for another work week? Can it really? My word, where does the time go? But you know what? It's okay, because Friday will be here before we know it. Bye for now, and I'll see you soon. Thank you.